Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and after about a day and a half of travel and docking, I can confirm that SpaceX's Dragon 2 spacecraft has in fact reached the space station and docked successfully. So I'm going to rewind to Friday night slash Saturday morning, depending upon your time zone. We're going to go through the launch and a lot of the important stuff. So this was from Launchpad uh, 39A which is the same launch pad used for Apollo 11 and other lunar missions and, of course, for many space shuttle flights. On board, there was a mannequin that was named Ripley. This had all sorts of sensors on board to make sure that, uh, you know, they were measuring human effects. There was also a zero-G indicator in the form of this plushy Earth. This is, of course, a great tradition on Soyuz launches. The Dragon 2 capsule is an evolution of the Dragon 1. One of the most obvious differences is it has a an integrated launch abort system using the Super Draco 2 thrusters. These are There's eight of these in these pods around the outside, and they provide more than enough thrust to out-accelerate the booster if there is a problem during the launch. So they can abort from zero altitude, and they can also abort while the booster is flying. They have not actually tested this in flight. That's what's going to happen after this capsule is finished. Inside, the capsule currently has four seats. The crew will be able to control most of the spacecraft functions through these high-tech modern touch screens, although there are uh, apparently armrest controls which provide some physical controls uh, if these all fail. On Friday night, I had to rush home from a fancy party at Cirque du Soleil so that I could live tweet the launch, but the launch was pretty much exactly as we've seen before. The only the differences were really subtle. Obviously, this is a brand new uh, Block 5 booster, a brand new Dragon 2. The ascent trajectory is shallower than normal, and the reason is that they, uh, if there's an abort, they want to minimize the G-forces on the capsule. And while they would normally have the ability to perform a return-to-launch site landing with a, a payload of this mass, instead they kept more of the fuel on the spacecraft, improved their performance margins and landed off the coast. We didn't see much of the descent, but as a consolation, the barge camera kept up throughout the entire landing. Usually this gets shut down because the antennas vibrate too much and they lose, they lose the uplink. Another big difference between Dragon 2 and Dragon 1 is that Dragon 1 needed to be captured using the space station's manipulator arm. It wouldn't dock actively, it would berth, so this crew would grab it and then they would move it to the position where it would be locked onto the space station. Dragon 2 is supposed to do the entire rendezvous and uh, docking all on its own. And so yeah, we got to watch this around, you know, 2 a.m. last night. The rendezvous and approach strategy involved an R-bar approach, which means they came out of the radial vector, that is, in from the Earth. So we could see the capsule silhouetted against the clouds of the Earth, and later you could see the darkness of the Earth. Of course, they're traveling around the Earth, and every 45 minutes it would switch from day to night. And as the capsule got really close, we could see all the details on the space station. Those aren't solar panels, those are the radiator panels. The space station, of course, has to deal with uh, getting rid of waste heat. And so it has these panels that extend down, usually on the shaded side of the station, and they are angled so that the sun doesn't hit them directly, so that most of the heat gets re-radiated. But as someone that really likes to fly spaceships and video games, this was my favourite part of the, the approach. We got to see the heads-up display, well not the heads-up display, the computer displays that the crew on board the spacecraft will use for rendezvous and docking. This is a massive step forward compared to what we see in Soyuz. Now, obviously, you've got the camera in the middle, you've got velocity and distance indicators, you've got a sun position indicator, and in the bottom right, you have an artificial horizon showing the orientation or the location of the spacecraft, the space station on the sky. In the bottom left, you have the thruster positions, right? So you see those will flash on and off when they fire. So yeah, if you're a Kerbal modder and want to add this to the game, I will totally fly this thing. After the commanded backup maneuver for testing, most of the terminal approach took place on the daytime sites. We got a really good look at the spacecraft. We got a look at the docking hardware and everything as well. The Dragon 2 covers a lot of the critical stuff during launch with a cover. On the Dragon, it just gets ejected, but this one folds away and folds back. You can see that it has a big fat mouth like a, a, a dragon, I guess, ready to breathe fire. Indeed, four of the thrusters that are used are underneath that cap, so that has to be opened relatively early in the mission. 
At the back there, you can also see the trunk. The trunk has uh, fins on it. It has black on one surface because that is solar panels. It also includes some thermal radiator systems, but it's really actually pretty dumb compared to the service modules we see on, say, the Apollo Command module or, the, or even that of Starliner and Orion. As the name suggests, the trunk is also a cargo area. It can be used to carry unpressurized cargo. In particular, on a previous mission, they were carrying the international docking adapter to the space station in the trunk. Unfortunately, that mission was lost when a helium tank in the second stage broke free and ruptured the second stage tank. So the international docking adapter did get delivered to the station eventually, and it's a new standard for docking. It's pretty much an adaptation of an old standard, but it, what's important here is you see how the petals interact and how you have this soft mating ring that absorbs the force as it comes in and stops it and you know slows the spacecraft down makes for a more gentle docking this is actually an inter international standard you can go and download it and if you want to build something that interacts with the space station you have to conform with that standard first but yeah you know it's, it's all free and open and out there if you want to build your own models when the spacecraft approached to within 20 meters, it was ordered to sit there and wait for the conditions to be right. First of all, they were concerned about uh, television up, you know, connectivity, and then they were concerned that the, the sun was going to be setting behind the space station, as the you know, from the capsule's point of view. So it would be shining into the cameras. So they decided to wait until after dark. And one of the upsides to this decision is you can really see those Draco thrusters firing as it begins to move in towards the docking node and make sure that it's lined up correctly. Also, I can't help but notice that from this angle, it does look a lot like the pods from 2001. I half imagined it, you know, Ripley calling out, you know, open the pod bay doors, Hal. Of course, Ripley was doing just about as much flying as a real astronaut would have to do in this situation. They're mostly just sitting there watching hands off, making sure that the spacecraft operated. I mean, the main interaction with the astronauts during this approach was that they were telling it occasionally, oh, there's an emergency back off. But that was all. They weren't flying this. In fact, the last couple of meters, they are specifically in, you know, ordered to be hands off. I really hope we get to see some better pictures of this. I mean, this was nice to have it on the stream at like 720p, but I'm sure there's better quality images that can come out of this. You can also see in the middle there the the window that the astronauts can, they can look inside the spacecraft. But in an emergency, they would actually be able to navigate a, an approach with that, although they probably wouldn't. And so now, yeah, you get to see the view from the camera in the middle here. And this is it docking and it's very wobbly as you see it's rather like a Kerbal docking adapter because Kerbal docking uses soft body physics it will the, the ships will tend to oscillate and wobble around and we've always joked about how, how unrealistic that is and guess what NASA's clearly been inspired by Kerbal they've decided to use soft joints instead no just kidding the international docking adapter standard's been around for a pretty long time. So that's soft capture, then the spacecraft runs motors to pull in that uh, capture ring so that it locks into place, and then they attach all the latches and make sure they provide a link, which is you know, sufficiently strong that it can hold the pressure of the atmosphere. Finally, about a couple of hours after that, the crew got to go inside and meet the two uh, crew members of this maiden voyage. Unfortunately, the astronauts missed an amazing opportunity to play Lalo Schifrin's amazing theme from Enter the Dragon. Although they did, however, pay tribute to the salvage scene at the start of Aliens by entering the new vessel wearing respirator gear. Uh, this is actually because the spacecraft has a f refrigerator on board. Most of the spacecraft don't, and they've been concerned to make sure that the cooling system doesn't leak into the air. So... So they perform this early work with respirators just to make sure they're safe. It's not because they're worried about face huggers or even worse, space bees. But everything went according to schedule, so everything's looking good at this point. I don't know, I haven't seen the exact internal details. Maybe there's some systems they're concerned with, but we'll find out more afterwards. Everything's looking good. It'll remain there for about a week or so. One of the design requirements is that the spacecraft has to be safe after eight months parked at the space station so it can act as a lifeboat. Uh, you know, Soyuz right now is limited by its peroxide fuel, whereas... The Dragon 2 doesn't use that kind of fuel that degrades, so I don't know what is going to be the limiting factor on its orbital life. But in a few days' time, it will undock from the space station and deorbit into the Atlantic and be recovered, and then this spacecraft, this actual capsule, will be reused for the crew abort test. 
where they'll stick this capsule on another booster, fly the booster and make sure that the thing can handle escaping from a worst case scenario. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.